morning, everyone. Good morning. Have Sava. this morning for a little unplugged.
sing praises to you on this Sabbath day. So we're here today with our OC Grace family, and we're just blessed. And we love you. The words speak for themselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome. It's great to have you here at OC Grace First Service. So when I first came here, well, actually, before we came to the service, someone said, you should come to the service. And I said, great, what is it? And they told me, and I said, in the morning? I might fall asleep during the music. And my wife said, why is that any different than the 1130 service? So we don't fall asleep. It's great to have you here. We just want to have a few announcements. We're excited you're here. We're excited our online family is here. It's great having us in a community all around the world. There's a few things coming up today in Griffith Park. There's a hike at 5 p.m. Next week, there's another hike at Whiting Ranch Wilderness Park. And next Sabbath, we have a movie night. So a lot of things going on in this church family. And obviously, there's a variety of services happening here today. So I wanted to invite up some of our friends from Orangewood Academy, Zadie and Yesenia, and they have a few words to share with us. Give them a round of applause. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Um, my name is Yesenia Guerrero I'm a Spanish culinary career ed ESL teacher for Orangewood Academy. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit more about Orangewood. This right here, this beautiful lady standing next to me, um, this is Zadie Olivaria. She's our art teacher and um, marketing coordinator for Orangewood Academy. Um, and I know we've heard the phrase family a lot for Orangewood, but you don't really understand <laughs> how much it really is a family until you become part of the family. Um, I've been at Orangewood for five years now. My entire family is in Texas. I have zero family here in California and being a part of this Orangewood family has really impacted me and not just me, but teachers and students, they are my kids. And um, it's very, very special. Orangewood offers from preschool through 12th grade have preschool starting at two years old, so um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, and I'll have Zadie talk about that. Um, so as Yesenia said, um, I, my name is Zadie, and I am uh, the art teacher and marketing, but not only that, I graduated from Orangewood. I came back, and I was a teacher, and now I'm a parent, and so I have been able to experience Orangewood in so many different ways. Being a, a student, um, being a teacher, and being in it love with these students and then now being a parent and having my children grow up in the Adventist school system and we are firm believers in Adventist education and so uh, this morning we're just standing up here we would like to share we're just sharing our story with you and just to invite you if um, you have any questions about Orangewood please uh, we have so many people here from Orangewood can I have anyone that's a student alumni parent of Orangewood would you raise your hands because I see so many of you this morning and um, this um, family has been so supportive to Orangewood. Thank you so much. Um, we have some events this week if you're interested. We have, on Thursday, we have our academic expo from 3.30 to 6.30. And we have projects from all the way from our tiny little preschoolers. You can see all the projects they've been working on all the way to our high schoolers. And um, it's a great opportunity to see what we do all year long. And on Friday, we have a benefit concert at 7 p.m. in our Tolan Auditorium. Um, Los Sierra University will be putting that on, so we just like to invite you to that. Um, and if you have any questions, again, we are here and happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. We're excited to have you worship with us here today.
Celebrations are given, the song rejoices. Life songs remind us of our seasons, our growth and change. They were never meant to be hidden in that old yellowed notebook. They're not meant to be simply read from dry mouths to closed ears. They are meant to be sung, sung with passion, sung with urgency, sung throwing all caution to the wind. Your songs, your journeys, your seasons are meant to be sung. He 
try to slip past his defense without granting innocence. Lay down a list of what is wrong, the things you've told him all along, and pray that God he hears you, and pray that God he hears you. Oh, where did I go wrong? A lost friend, somewhere along in the bitterness, and I would have stayed up with you all night had I known how to save a life. How to save a life. As he begins to raise his voice, you lower yours and grant him one last choice. Drive until you lose the road or break with the ones you followed. He will do Amen. Yeah. Chanel, I don't know what it is, but your voice always makes me choke up. That song got me this morning. I've heard that song a million times, and uh, you singing it got me. Thank you. Whew. Anyone uh, ever experienced this before? You say something, you put it out there, and all of a sudden, you said it, and you can't take it back. Anyone else with me there? You said it, and now the words are just kind of sitting there heavy. Or maybe someone said something to you, and it shocked you so much that you're thinking, wait, what? Did you just say the thing? And it just kind of sits there. In the back of your mind, you wish you could kind of take it back. But you know, that's just not a possibility. Anyone in here? ever have a relationship end and you have the conversation and you go through yet you spend all night discussing, discussing, arguing and it ends. And weeks, months later, maybe years later, you might look back and you think, if only I had said this or maybe if I had, if I just brought up this thing, it could have, things could have changed. Maybe you are a parent and your kids are doing what kids do. They're kind of going in different directions. And you think to yourself, what if I had just, if I had been a better parent then, if I had just done this thing, if I said this, if I had read that book then, all things could have turned out so differently. And you begin beating yourself up over it. Anyone losing some sleep? <laughs> you can raise your hand. Me too. Yeah, that one thing that you did a long time ago, or maybe just recently, 
And it's the one thing that you don't want to think about. But guess what thing always comes up right there in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep? That thing. And no matter how many sheep you count, before you know it, it's the thing that you're counting over and over and over again. And you can't escape it, can you? Because that's what happens when we experience something called negative regret. It kind of eats you up. And you have all these questions of what ifs. Regret. What do you do with regret? What do you do with these moments where you wonder, what should I have done it differently? And you begin beating yourself up over it. There's whole studies done on regret, and I find it really interesting. Regret is is a negative cognitive state in which you replay something over and over again, and you beat yourself up for it. Am I the only one in this room that does this? First of all, can we just all admit we do this a little bit? Okay, good. Look around. Look around the room. There are other people as crazy as you. Does that make you feel good? Yeah, you're not actually alone in this. We all go through it. This, this, this negative regret, it does a number on you psychologically. And it can get so bad that at some point in time, you may be at the place where you can't even function normally. You can't even do your work normally. It's gotten such a hold of you. Here's something I found really fascinating. 44% of women surveyed in America, they said, we have a tremendous amount of regret. Men, they surveyed the same amount of men, 19%. (laughs) And I get it because my wife, she has an amazing memory. She will say, do you remember that time four years ago, we were sitting here, you were eating this, and I was eating this, and, and, and you said, and I'll be like, man, I don't remember. Did I really say that? Yeah, and you also said this and this and this, and the waiter's name was this. I'm like, I can't remember what I ate this morning. It's 10 a.m. I can't remember any of it. Regret. And we all handle it a little bit differently, don't we? Regret. Americans are some of the most stressful people in the world. And we carry around a tremendous amount of regret, negative regret everywhere we go. And it does a number on us. We talked about emotionally, psychologically, but as far as your health goes, anyone ever, you don't have to raise your hand, ever, anyone ever gets so involved in this cycle of regret that you lose sleep and before you know it, you're sick all the time? says the guy that's sick. (laughs) Yeah, it can do a number on your body. Negative regret can do a number on you. It can really mess you up. And so the psalmist, they understood that sometimes you experience regret. Sometimes you do something, you experience something, and you wish you could do it differently, and sometimes you're tempted to beat yourself up over it. And so today we'll delve into this a little bit. The psalmist in chapter 34, he says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, for the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Now this word afflictions, that's not a great translation. The translation in the Hebrew, it actually means to misstep. To step in the wrong direction or a direction that you wish you hadn't stepped. It's having the decision and you decide, Well, I could go this way or that way. Well, there's chocolate. I'll go this way. And you take the misstep, right? You go a misdirection. And those are the things you will look back on and be tempted to have a lot of regret over. My friend Steve, he works in the medical industry, and he sells different devices to people in different hospitals. And he makes a fairly good living. And Steve told me in the early 1980s, He and some of his friends, who were really good at selling things, they came together, and there was this guy that was going to share this pitch with them. And this guy came in, and he said, I've got the next thing. I want you guys, as the beginning people, to start selling these. It's going to be huge. And so this guy came in, and he says says to them, "There's there's this device, we're calling it the heart stent. And we think almost all of the medical field soon will begin using these. And he explained what it was. And my friend thought, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. But a friend of his, 
who's in the room, who is, who's wise, and he'd had years of experience, he said, hey, hey, man, let's not get crazy. This may not be what you think it's going to be. This may just be a fad. It may pass. Let's think about it. Let's take some time on it. My friend decided to take this man's advice. And he lost a lot of money. And then years later, he found out that that guy, he went back and got in on the deal the day of. And my friend Steve, who's doing well now, he said he looks back on that and he has this holy vengeance. And he's got all these narratives of what he thinks really happened that day. He was doing this and this and this, and he was trying to get me. So angry. In Psalm 35, the writer has a friend. And this friend turns out to be an enemy and misuses and mistreats him. And I think Psalms 35 is pretty hilarious. Because it's the things that you and I don't like to say out loud, but we think about the people who wrong us. Here's some of the things that the writer in the Psalms says about that person. Lord, pull out the spears. Let's get him. Right? Let them be confused and frustrated. Let them be driving on I-5 and have a flat tire, Lord. In your holy name, curse their vehicle. Let their Prius run out of gas. Do it, Lord, please. He deserves it. God, persecute them, he says in chapter 35. And then my favorite, may their souls die in pits. Can you imagine if you said that out loud? You think it. You said it out loud. What do you think of Randall? I wish his soul would die in a pit. Man, that's some anger, brother. You got some anger. Sometimes people do us wrong. Sometimes things go the wrong direction. But here's the thing. Sometimes we, near, we need to learn how to let it out. We need to learn how to let it out. Sometimes you're angry. I belong to a church. I grew up in a church in the Midwest when I was told anger is bad. Don't be angry. You show anger, you're going against God's will. Because anger is a bad thing. And so I walked around a lot like this. How you doing, Tony? Happy <laughs> Someone would do me wrong. I'd hold it in. And I would get so frustrated. But the writer, the writer in this psalm, the writer's writing this hip-hop song of anger. It's just writing it out because it's got to go somewhere. And so the writer puts it all out there. A couple months ago, I had this meeting that I was so frustrated with. And I remember getting into my Acadia. It's like perfect white person suburbia transportation. I get in, I start cranking up Eminem. You gotta lose yourself in the room. And I'm starting to turn it up louder. And I'm getting angrier. I'm singing it out loud. And I'm just feeling good because I'm angry. And I get up to the light. And I'm just singing it. Ooh, I'm just getting, I'm ready to start crying. And I look over and there's this group of white girls <laughs> laughing at me in the car next to me. And pointing at the awkward middle-aged man singing Eminem. Of course, turn it down. <laughs> they leave, I crank it back up, I'm heading home. I'm angry. Sometimes we got to let out some of that anger, don't we? Let me ask you this. When you are frustrated, when you are angry, when you have these emotions, where does it go? What do you do with it? I know some people, when they're angry, they try to hold it in. And I'll be honest with you, it comes out. You think you're being tricky, it comes out. And we avoid you when it comes out. We see it growing. The volcano starts shifting and we're like, oh no, it's going to erupt. What do you do? What do you do with all that anger, that energy? Because it's normal to have it. Maybe go to the gym. You're lifting the weights. Joe Oswald is cranking it out. He's only got five pounds on each side, but he's cranking it out. Holy zealous. Or you're a runner. And you're just running, and, and you've been running for like eight hours. You don't even know where you are. You have to call your wife to pick you up. 
You got it out though. That anger. Maybe you're someone that needs to just write and you write and write or write songs or you go to the concert and you sing along with other angry people and you just get it out. How do you get it out? That anger. Because the reality is that emotion will come out somewhere. And you all have been there, haven't you? You sit at the dinner table and all of a sudden, poor Kimberly brings up, hey, John, would you please pass the peas? Peas? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like all of a sudden, oh, it's just like World War IV. Because we're already going toward three. Peas, and, and it just comes out. It just comes out. It's a mess. If we're not careful, our emotions will go somewhere. And the psalmist says, write it out. Write it out. Get it out. Get it out there. Something interesting happens, though, after you get the emotion out. You admit you're angry. You sing the hip-hop song. You get laughed at by a bunch of girls in a car. Whatever it is you do, when you get it out, something happens next that the psalmist shares. For as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. When you were mourning, you put yourself in sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into me my own bosom. Watch this. The individual here went from anger fully, and then they went into a state of sadness. They allowed themselves to feel sad. I'm a man, in case you didn't know. And at an early age, I was told this. You're a man, and you don't show emotion. You're a man, and you don't get sad. Right? Because that's weakness. You're a man. The worst thing you could possibly do in public is cry. You're a man. Men are tough. We don't experience those emotions. And I'll be honest with you, that has hurt me in so many ways growing up. I didn't have a father who told me, Tony, just come here. Let's just get it out. Let's talk about it. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be hurt. And the message we are sending to our young men all over this country is this. You should not allow yourself to feel sad or have emotions. Because that's not strength. It's weakness. And what happens to me and my friends, my male friends, is this. We go from anger, we skip sadness and depression, and we can't accept it. And so we stay in a perpetual state of just being angry. And we don't know what to do with it. And our souls are so wound up. All we needed was someone to say this. It's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to acknowledge that you are experiencing pain. It's okay to cry. And for the men in this room, I want to say this emotion, admitting that the thing hurt you, is actually a sign of strength. Pretending it didn't, Pretending that you're strong is a sign of weakness. It's a sign of weakness. The psalmist goes on, says we have to learn to mourn. And when we learn to mourn, we begin to allow ourselves to hope for something more. And I love this, as one mourns for their mother. Case in the other day, we were skateboarding. And of course... Dad forgets to put on the elbow pads and the knee pads. So we're going, and, and he biffs it really good. And he's laying in a puddle on the ground. He's crying. And me, I walk over, I grab him. I'm like, hey, buddy, good job. 
He's like, he's crying. He's like, Dad, it's bleeding. I said, yeah, that's a good strawberry. going to be an awesome scar, buddy. And I, my son said this. It was so beautiful. He said, I want mommy. <laughs> You're not good at this. That is right. Because sometimes in our moments of sadness, in our moments of hurt and pain and brokenness, sometimes calling out is a step toward wholeness. When you can actually muster the courage, because it takes courage to say, it hurt me, it was painful, that thing, I didn't deserve it. And you call out and say, I need help. It's like a child calling out to mom. And that's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Except that it hurts. Then we can begin moving forward. There's this verse in Psalms. And uh, it goes like this. Fill my heart with joy. I don't want that one. Fill my heart with joy. When their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. How many of you could use a little bit more abundant joy? Let me ask you a better question. How many of you could use a little more sleep? Yeah. Yeah. When you sleep, you have joy in the morning. And I think there are things that keep us from sleep. And I think when we learn to follow these steps that the psalmist gives us, when we learn to understand, yes, there's anger, experience it fully, be, be present to it, sing the song, yell if you need to yell, punch the punching bag, do what you need to do. But then understand, acknowledge that you're feeling hurt, that there's sadness, there's some depression. Once you do this, you can move into acceptance. You can take responsibility for the present and you can move into wholeness. That's what it looks like when we begin to follow what the psalmist says about regret. And so today I wonder, are any of you struggling with regret? Any of you needing to punch the punching bag? Any of you needing to get the thing out? Any of you needing to sit on this thing? Do you need to just cry? Do you need someone to talk to you can trust? Do you need to finally accept that it happened? Accept your part in it, take responsibility and move on? I wonder how many of you are with me in this. I want to close on this. A friend of mine, Robert, he and his brother Tim, their dad wasn't doing so well. They, Tim actually moved to Texas, and Robert lived close to dad there in Ohio. And Tim is the poster boy for like the good son. He's the good son that calls all the time. Robert isn't. He's the one that every once in a while will call when he needs something. But mom died and it left dad alone. And Tim, he tried to make as many visits as he could, but Robert was right there. And Robert was so busy, dad would call and say, hey, do you wanna to go to the game? He loved baseball. Rarely went to the games. Barely spent time with his dad. And Robert got a phone call and Tim said, hey man, dad is not doing well. And I hate to harp on you again, but he's only got so much time and he has serious dementia. Robert, would you visit him? I think you're gonna regret it. So Robert said, yeah, 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 yeah. Robert started though to finally go visit his dad. And the pain of visiting his dad was difficult because dad was different, couldn't remember well. But the more Robert visited dad, the more closely connected he felt. And Robert said he would watch games with his dad on Sundays there in the hospital bed. He would spend time with dad playing cards, whatever he could do. Brought the kids over periodically. And he said, finally, one day, he felt this overwhelming sense. 
he needed to apologize. And so Robert, he held his dad's hand and he said, Dad, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry that I wasn't the son that you wanted me to be. I'm sorry I didn't visit more. I'm so sorry I didn't call you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I wasn't the son that you needed me to be. And dad, he kind of got up and he kind of looked at Robert strangely. He said, he said, Tim, you live in Texas. I'm so happy you visit me. I love you and your brother so much. You are both on your own paths. And I love both of you dearly and I'm so proud of both of you. Robert's dad wasn't holding anything against him. And so Robert didn't need to hold that either. And today, I don't know what kind of regrets you have, but if you have them, if you're human, I might ask you to consider going through what the psalmist does. Consider letting the anger out, accepting that you are feeling sadness and pain and brokenness. Call out, seek wholeness, and then begin walking in it. You're not alone, and freedom and wholeness is right there in our grasp. You don't have to feel negative regret anymore. You can walk in wholeness. No one is holding that against you. May God bless you today in a special way on the Sabbath. Pastor Tony, I'd like to thank you for that message of anger, regret, sadness, pain, depression, uplifting. And yet, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in peace. I heard that too. So, uh, before we talk about offering, um, I know we welcome the guests. Uh, as, as we collect the offering, we want you to know that uh, your gift is your presence. We appreciate you being here. We certainly don't want you to feel an obligation to give, even though if that is part of your worship, you know, you're certainly welcome to do so. How many of you get Pastor Dan's newsletter by email? So I was reading that. It uh, came out late yesterday, and, and I was reading about all of the things that they're doing in the Philippines. And it, uh, frankly, it was exhausting to read. We're, we're building three churches. We're helping a school we're uh, helping people have clean water and all of these things take resources and uh, and and I have to say I've had an opportunity to be a part of perhaps a half a dozen churches in in my life and and I would say that this church um, appreciates and respects um, and and uses with great purpose the resources that we as participants provide. OC Grace First, we strive to be an authentic expression of the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're here to do. And some of that is, is what we do on this campus where on any given week, 500 people get touched in one form or another. Or in our local community where we feed people. Or in places around the world like the Philippines or Brazil or Vietnam. So I just want to say, as the deacons come forward to collect the offering, that you make a difference. And we thank you for it. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this church, these members and people within, and a chance to give, to make a small sacrifice, to make a difference in the cause of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
sees it as the act of your let go.
So, Lord, whatever stage, whatever season we're in, we ask that you will give us the strength and the endurance to get through those seasons, those moments in life. And, Lord, whatever regrets we are holding right now, we ask that, Lord, you will help us move through them in whole ways, ways that bring us freedom. And, Lord, let us remember we're not doing it alone, but we have people all around us to help us through it. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful book the book of Psalms, this book of songs that helps guide us. It gives us a song to sing whatever season we're in. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Hope you all have a great Sabbath. We have another study up here afterwards that goes a little deeper over this. Uh, make sure to give someone a hug on the way out. I will not be in the back this time because I don't want to give you all my germs. So blessings today, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Go do something fun together as a family.